The purpose of this video is to provide a checklist approach to trip planning. It is a primer, an overview. The list is from Priest and Gas's book. It is a good place to start. There is a difference between trip planning and trip leadership. The emphasis of this presentation is on trip planning or what to do prior to the actual experience. Trip planning lays the foundation for trip leadership. An overriding consideration in trip planning is to match the skills and competencies of the group to the challenges and risks of the experience. Not only does this help lead to a peak experience for the participants, but a safer experience. The Adventure Experience Paradigm, or AEP, embodies this concept. A common thread throughout each of the planning components, whether stated or not, is an attempt to match the challenges and risks with the skills and competencies of the group. Often overlooked is the rationale or why you are conducting the trip. Is it for adventure or simply because your child needs to complete an outdoor trip? Often overlooked or simply assumed, it is important because it should determine the rest of the trip planning. Philosophically, an outdoor experience should lead to appreciation of the outdoors. The Aldo Leopold quote at the end of a Sand County Almanac captures this importance. You are a recreational engineer, engineering or planning to create an outdoor experience for your participants. For the purposes of this video, the activity is canoe and kayak related. It can be a day or multi-day trip. Often the activity and location are closely linked together. Canoes and boundary waters go hand in hand. As noted, the location is often closely linked with the activity. Do you need any permits, reservations, and campsite permits? The activity and where you are going helps to determine the challenges and risks of the activity along with the routing and scheduling in the next section. Routing determines travel times, distances between campsites, and the difficulty of the day's travel. The trip leader planned for day three of their backcountry trip. Figuring they travel two to two and a half miles per hour, he calculates distances and times. He identifies portages and the lunch stop below the portage. Roughly a seven hour day. If they leave camp by 9 o'clock in the morning, they should arrive at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on what he estimates to be a moderately hard day of paddling. Note that the leader is seeking a day's activities to match the skills and competencies of the participants on the trip. In addition, consider contingency plans, alternative routes, layover days, and potential evacuation routes. In a sense, routing and scheduling, location, and the activity focus on the risk and challenge side of the AEP. In contrast, participants, groups, and staff focus on the skill and competency side of the AEP paradigm. Participants should have the appropriate knowledge, skills, abilities, and experiences for the trip. Knowledge includes being aware of the experience they will be experiencing. Marketing materials need to accurately reflect the experience. It goes hand in hand with skills. Skills include paddling and camping skills. Prior experience may be required. Health forms should be completed and medication should be known. Participants should sign waivers. The group is a sum of the participants and staff. Often there are practical external constraints on the size of the group. Band size may be a limiting factor. Many agencies have limited 15 passenger vans to 10 passengers. With two leaders, that leaves eight participants. Many resource managers have campsite limitations to help protect the resource. There are ethical considerations, including the carrying capacity of the resource and group size. The staff needs to have the appropriate knowledge, skill, abilities, and experiences for the activity being conducted. 
Usually this includes the appropriate certifications recommended or required by the parent organization or the industry in general. Does the staff have the appropriate first aid and CPR certifications? Normally a minimum of two leaders are required. Leader to participant ratios can range from one to six to one to 12, depending on the type of activity being conducted. Often on the trip, one leader can take the lead and the other will follow up as the sweep. If one instructor is injured, the other can assume the leadership role. Develop an equipment checklist. It tells you what you need for your trip. It can be comprehensive or simply a list of several items you don't want to forget. Personal equipment is what participants need to bring, such as clothing, bedroom accessories, tools, and recreation. Also include what not to bring. Group equipment is equipment provided by the outfitter and is generally common to everyone such as tents, kitchen equipment, food, water, and the first aid kit. The outfitter may provide nearly everything on the checklist or not much at all. Use the equipment list on the right as your starting point. Tailor it to your needs. Add or subtract items as appropriate. Food planning is either by meal or bulk rationing. Planning by meals works well on short trips like weekend excursions. Create a menu. Multiply the portions by the number of people and pack the individual meals in plastic storage bags. Meals can be repackaged fresh food, freeze-dried or dehydrated foods or combinations of each. Used on longer backcountry trips, the Knowles bulk rationing approach determines the pounds of food per person per day. Depending on trip conditions, plan on between one and a half to two and a half pounds per person per day. The amount of food needed is calculated by food categories. Purify water or bring it with you. Plan on a gallon of water per person per day. Figure on eight pounds per gallon. In brackish or salt water, you need to bring your own water with you, which can add sufficient weight to your canoes. In areas with fresh water, purification methods include chemical, pump, UV light, and boiling. Boiling water is effective but inefficient. Giardia is always a concern on inland waters. There are accommodations getting to the site and accommodations during the backcountry trip. Accommodations during the trip can vary greatly. Backcountry shelters and designated campsites may be required. Some are first come, first serve basis. Some can be reserved on the internet months before the trip. Others can be reserved on site two days prior to entering the backcountry. In some cases, backcountry shelters are provided. If tents are used, consider tents that are self-supporting, have mosquito netting, that are not too large for the campsite, chicky, or tent platform. Traveling to and from the outing is usually considered the most dangerous portion of the trip. On any of the following suggestions, check the common practices within your agency and other agencies. This provides you with a defensible position. Adhere to driving requirements, including driver's license, insurance, driving record, and the completion of online van training courses, if appropriate. Follow the rules of the road, including driving time, brakes, seat belts, and speed limits. Make sure the vehicles have proper safety equipment, including spare tire, flares, and proper maintenance. The driver is responsible for inspecting the trailer hitch, trailer, and roof racks. Don't overload the vehicle or trailer. At the destination, consider parking arrangements and, if needed, shuttle your vehicles. There are communications with the group and with the base camp. Most wilderness areas do not have cell phone reception. A satellite phone may be a good investment for communications with the base camp. 
use it discreetly and in seclusion can help maintain the remoteness of the wilderness experience. Consider using paddle communications within the group. Walkie-talkies are an option, but the batteries tend to wear down quickly. Also, if you need walkie-talkies, your group may be strung out along the trail more than it should be. Your budget depends on the costs you need to cover. Private providers may need to cover both capital and operating expenses. Institutional programs may obtain a vehicle from the motor pool and use instructional budgets which defer costs elsewhere. The direct costs to students may be food, accommodations, and other incidentals. Again, budget items which need to be included can vary greatly. Let us return to where we began. The first step in trip planning and risk management is to match the challenges and risks of the activity with the skills and competencies of the participants. Most of the sections in this presentation can be viewed as contributing to risk management. Many accidents and lawsuits result when a mismatch occurs. Health forms and participant waivers are usually required and help reduce risks. Usually associated with agencies, an emergency action plan outlines the actions taken in case of a serious incident, including managing the incident, crisis communications, and post-incident considerations. An emergency information document includes evacuation plans, emergency contact phone numbers, hospital, police, and emergency locations, search and rescue procedures, missing persons forms, and who to contact if there is an incident. This video is a primer. Some additional resource materials are included here. Again, match the challenges and risks with the skills and competencies of the participants. Questions for discussion. Leopold's quote is, Recreational development is a job not of building roads into lovely country, but of building receptivity into the still unloving human mind. In terms of the rationale and activity for the activity, what are you doing to bring receptivity into your participant's mind? Matching the challenges and risks of the activity with the skills and competencies of the participants creates the foundation for a peak experience for everyone on the trip. It is a theme throughout this presentation. Discuss the pros and cons of using this paradigm as your guide in trip planning. If there is one guiding principle, could this be it? Since the activity and location are usually predetermined, route selection and the scheduling become an important in matching the skills and competencies of the group with the challenges and risks. Discuss the implications for your trip planning. Staff need to have the appropriate knowledge, skill, abilities, and experience, including certificates. What do you think they are? Compare this with what others may require. Do you need to make changes or improvements? Satellite phones can be expensive. Do you really need one? Discuss the pros and cons of having or not having one. There you have it, a primer on trip planning. Remember this is the beginning and not an end.